or sing along on the screen when it comes up. Uh, we often hear people say, this speaker needs no introduction, then they give an introduction. But I think what we mean when we say that is, uh, he doesn't really need to be introduced, but he deserves to be. And uh, we are appreciative for Brother John D. Berry. He has distinguished himself as a regular uh, featured speaker here at the MSOP lectureship. He started preaching when he was 16, and he hasn't stopped, and he won't stop until the Lord calls him home, I'm convinced. And he's willing to dedicate himself to go the extra mile or miles. Uh, he drove here from Nashville on Monday, and I'm glad he did because the remarks he made at the Decades of Devotion dinner, if you were there, uh, will always be remembered and treasured. Several people have commented to me that... Uh, the, that speech, though brief, was one of the highlights of the lectureship. And so uh, Brother D. Berry then turned around and drove back to Nashville for his legislative duties there in the House, and then turned around and drove back here uh, today to speak here tonight. I don't know if he has to go back to Nashville <laughs> tomorrow, too. <laughs> I think he does. Um, but he's putting some miles on the vehicle this week. Uh, to help us, and then I think he's in a gospel meeting next week at uh, South Haven, if I'm not mistaken, if you're interested in supporting him and his good preaching there. Uh, but uh, we love him for the reasons that uh, we love all gospel preachers. He preaches the word, and you won't leave here tonight wondering what, wonder what he meant. You'll know. When he says, thy word is very pure in scripture, Brother D. Barry is just the man to expound upon that because he preaches as if he believes that the Word of God is pure, and we're now so delighted to invite him to the platform to preach to you about this subject, and we look forward to hearing this message. Brother John D. Barry, thy word is very pure. There are several things that I remember about my father and my family in my early days as a young man in our home that stay with me constantly and consistently in everything that I do. They have become principles within my life. They have helped me develop what is my work ethic, what, is, what are the principles of my life as I try and strive as flawed as I am and all of us can be from time to time. As I strive to be what God wants me to be. I feel humbled when I'm in the presence of the preachers who are in this room. I won't start calling names because they're too numerous. Men who have distinguished themselves as gospel preachers, as servants of the Lord. Men who have been on the battlefield for years and have left it all on the field, as the football coaches say, because they've given everything to their God. That's the kind of father and mother and family that I was in that left it all there, which is one of the reasons why I'm so impressed uh, to always say something to let you know who I am and why I am who I am. I remember one time that my father uh, was, was raising some squash. He had two acres of squash and an acre of okra. Who plants an acre of okra? Uh, but, but he did. And it was the hardest thing that I think that we've ever done, uh, Brother Clark, is trying to pick that okra because you had to pick the stuff every day. But I remember getting tired and weary and worn out, and, and my sister Bunny and, uh, is back there. She was young, and my brother Tony, uh, he just was kind of along for the ride. He was a baby. Uh, but I remember picking a basket of squash, and I was angry. It was hot. It was dusty. And all summer long, we had been working with those two acres of squash and acre of okra, and I was just sick of all of it. 
And I remember picking those squash and I just dumped them in that square basket. We were going to take it to a place called the Winter Garden in Bales, Tennessee, where the farmers and my dad worked at the post office. But he said that stuff built character. I felt we had enough uh, character. But he kept on planting junk uh, for us to pick. And I threw those squash in, in that basket, and I didn't care what they, I didn't care if they had bumps on them, half rotten, I didn't care. And boy, he got on me that day. Because he says, you need to understand something, Nick. He says, all of this work we're doing is of no good, I'm, I'm somewhat quoting him, uh, but it, it's no good. If you don't pay attention to what you're doing and you don't take pride in it, he says he picked up a squash that literally disintegrated in his hands because I, I didn't care. I really didn't. I was hot and tired and sweaty and stinky and I was ready to go home. And I threw that squash in there and he picked that thing up and it disintegrated in his hand. He says, this will rot the whole basket, Nick. He said, this would rot the whole basket. You don't put rotten stuff with good stuff because the rotten stuff will ruin the good stuff. And that lesson has stayed with me. It has remained with me uh, as I have tried to preach the gospel and raise my family and be a good brother, to be a good husband, to be a good father, to be a good preacher just trying to go to heaven that God's trying to tell every last one of us you don't put the rotten stuff with the good stuff and that's just the rotten stuff we need to get rid of that stuff and put it away from us because that's exactly what God wants us to do and how God wants us to be we're God's children folks we're God's children you are the most important people on the face of this earth because you're the folks who are going to go and stand four square on what is written, look the devil in his old ugly red eyes, and preach the truth, proving all things, standing for what is right, and saying those things that uplift men and lifting up the cross of Christ, who said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, as as we stand here tonight, we stand in a time where the pure word of God is absolutely needed. The very pure word of God is absolutely needed. And you know, when we go and we study uh, that passage and we read about what David said, or the psalmist rather said in Psalms 119, And 140, and Psalms 119 is often renowned because of the length of the book. It's a long book. And you know what, Brother Moshe could play a trick on you students by making you memorize that thing. Uh, But be that as it may, it's renowned because it's the longest book in the Bible. The writing is done in a style called an acrostic, as you already know, and each of the 22 Hebrew letters, are it's, they start a verse, but in Psalms 119, they start eight verses with each of the 22 letter, letters, which gives that chapter its length. Uh, but in doing so, the theme has a very wonderful theme, and we can know the theme because of the repetitive mention of the word of God. That the psalmist is lifting up and lauding and giving giving reverence to the word of God. And you know, this brings to mind something that the Apostle Paul wrote a long time ago. When the Apostle Paul was in the midst of his journeys, in the midst of his travels, in the midst of his preaching, in the midst of taking the gospel to the Gentile world as he had been commissioned to do. You've heard me say and other preachers say about this wonderful evangelist that he was snake bit, shipwrecked, stoned, he was caned, he was jailed, he was locked up or chained to a Roman legionnaire for over two years. This man of God gave God everything he has and how in the world can we go to this book And read about James, who the sword went in his belly and came out of his back. And John, who was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And Paul, whose head was severed from his body on Nero's chopping block. And Matthew, who they said was killed in Ethiopia. And we go through each of those men. And don't mention Fate's Hall of Fame in Hebrew chapter 11. 
How in the world are we as God's children going to prepare ourselves to stand before the same God that they stand before? To stand before the same God that they served? To stand before the same God that they sacrificed for and say, Lord, I, I just did just enough. I just did just enough. These men gave and women gave everything they had. So the apostle Paul said to the brethren in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and verses 17. Paul said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God breathed and therefore profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, instruction in what is righteous, in righteousness. Why, Paul? What's the purpose of this inspired God breathed, pure, very pure word? That the man of God may be perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works, equipped, ready, ready for battle, ready to stand, ready to speak, ready to fight, ready to do whatever is necessary, whatever is necessary, so that the cross of Christ can be lifted up before the eyes of doubting and ignorant uh, uh, and belligerent men of this world, both the psalmists. And the Apostle Paul said similar things about the Word of God. The psalmist gives a diverse and most faceted nature of God's Word with several synonyms that talk about God's Word. He calls it the law or God's intent to reveal his will. He calls them precepts or God's emphasis on his position as creator and the only one to be worshipped. He calls it the word and he uses both Hebrew terms meaning the word to stress the God breathed inspired will and way of our God and father in heaven. Throughout that long chapter he uses the term testimonies. He uses the term judgments, commandments, faithfulness, ways, even God's name over and over and over. Why? Why? Because God's word is the only thing that's going to save this world. The world in which we live in today, God's word was given. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. We didn't merit it. We didn't get ourselves in some kind of shape where God says, you know what, those folks down there are getting it together. We need to do something for them. No. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commended, demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, still sinning, still being hard-headed, still doing everything he told us not to do. He still sent his son to die for us on the cross. Every person in this room, every one of y'all can quote the golden text of the Bible as we call it often. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. If God loved us so much, so in that verb of degree, so much, that he was willing to have Jesus become a man, the incarnation of God, to become a man, don't you understand that that's the pillar that's the ground of the truth that God loved us this much. Paul said it to Titus as he told him and left him at Crete to set things in order that was wanting. He left Timothy at Ephesus. But at Crete, Paul told Titus in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and verses 12, he said, For the grace of God that bring it salvation, God's grace that bring it salvation has appeared unto all men teaching us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I mentioned in my manuscript about my grandmother, Sister Susie Hall. 
And Sister Susie Hall, my grandmother, Sister Mary Garrett, Garrett my great-grandmother, and Sister Pearl E. Deberry, my mother. From time to time, when we would go to fellowship meetings when I was a child, the women would set, the, the men would set up tables with plywood on sawhorses, and the women would put their beautiful tablecloths on them and put their beautiful aprons on. And isn't it something how back in the day when we had a whole lot less that we were a whole lot more happy with being God's children under a shade tree on the outside of a country church. I can see that day like it was yesterday where they stood there proudly and served their food as folks walked by and fixed their paper plates and went somewhere and found a place to sit on a car or wherever and eat their dinner. My grandmother would make these ornate bowls of potato salad. She was a wonderful cook and a meticulous cook. My dear would make flowers out of eggs and out of uh, uh, relishes and carrots. And the stuff would be so pretty you hated to eat it. But when she set that big bowl of potato salad on that table, a big old green fly, I saw it. I hate that fly. I hate that fly to this day. That big joker, he flew up, did a flip, and did a nose dive straight into the middle of my dear's potato salad. My dear turned around and saw him and screamed and grabbed the whole bowl and ran for the garbage can with all us boys saying, hold it, hold him up, wait, wait. We're saying, he just in one place, dip him out right there. <laughs> But they said, no, she threw the whole thing away. Because as far as she was concerned, if any of it was corrupt, all of it was corrupt. And she threw that beautiful bow. Thank goodness she had another smaller bow hid away. And I still got a few spoons full of potato salad. All the preachers ate first. <laughs> But you know, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10, and verses 1, Solomon, in a book that is called the book of all excellent wisdom, the book of Ecclesiastes, he has a similar situation about a perfumer, a person who mixes concoctions together that people buy for various reasons, some medicinal, some to smell good. And he said in Ecclesiastes, chapter 10, and verses 1, dead flies in the ointment. Dead flies in the ointment of the perfumer. He says it sends forth a stinking savor. In essence, in those days when flies corrupted something, it began to stink and the stench and the smell made it in something that could not be used. It was something that could only be thrown away. And when you think about this, the Lord used a similar uh, imagery in the book of Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and verses 20, that all of you can quote again. The Lord said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust that corrupt and thieves break through and steal. Moth, another flying insect that would eat your stuff or corrupt your stuff. He says, there's always something that will corrupt what you own if you don't watch what you're doing. He says, but lay up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor thieves break through and steal. The Lord says, here's the principle, y'all. Here's the principle. Where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. And that's what the Lord is saying to every last one of us. You need to love the pure word of God, the very pure word of God, because it's something that even as Solomon said throughout that book of Proverbs, that when we trust it, when we trust it, he said, get wisdom and in all you're getting, get an understanding. When we allow the very pure word of God to open our eyes Brothers and sisters, this makes life so much better. So what is Satan's intent? When we start talking about the very pure word of God, as the psalmist used in that particular verse, verse 140, when we think about it, we go back. When God looked at everything he created, God looked at the animals. He said, that's good. 
God looked at the earth where he had planted the seeds on the earth and brought the grass and covered the dearth. God said, that's good. God scooped out the oceans and scooped out the rivers and the lakes and the ponds and the streams. God said, that's good. God created the creatures, the crawling and flying and billowing and mooing and cackling creatures that walked upon the face of the earth. God said, that's good. But at the end of everything God created, after God has made man, after God has made everything, God made a final assessment and God said, yea, it is very good. And when God looks at his people, what he has given them is a very pure word, not just something that serves a purpose, but something that serves to recreate, to reinvigorate, to restart our lives and to lift us up. So therefore, what's Satan trying to do to you? What's he trying to do to you? What does Satan do? Why does he deploy false gospels, false ways, false words, false truths? Because Satan wants you to live in darkness. He can't stand you. He can't stand you. And many of us seem to forget that. Satan cannot stand you. You've got something he will never have. The love of God. The mercy of God. The grace of God. The justice of God, the forgiveness of God. And one day you can go to the place that his sorry self got kicked out of. One day you can go and live in heaven, a place that he can't go. I tell people all the time, hell wasn't made for you. It wasn't made for you. It was made for the devil and his angels. Jesus said to you in John chapter 14 and verses 1, for after telling Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me, after breaking Peter's heart and Peter's spirit probably being broken as he's asking himself, am I really going to do that? Am I really going to do that? Am I really going to say I don't know Jesus? And then Jesus helped him. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. The Lord says to all of us recovering sinners, for all of us who are striving to be well, for all of us who depend on his cleansing blood every day of our lives, as we ask him to forgive us, the Lord says, you don't worry. You just keep doing the best you can, obeying my will and getting stronger every day because I'm going to fix a place up for you. And I will come back and receive you to myself this is the reason why, brothers and sisters, you need the pure word of God. Because when it is not pure, the apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 14, Paul warned the brethren at Ephesus, the same brethren that John from the island of Patmos said, you've left your first love. You've left your first love. It's not about Christ anymore. It's not about his will anymore. It's not about what he wants from you anymore. Now it's about you. You've left your first love. And don't you know the apostle Paul said to those brethren that you henceforth be no more children. Stop being immature. Stop being people who aren't ready for the battle, for the fight, for the stand. Ready to speak and provoke one another to good work. Paul said stop being immature. That you henceforth be no more children, toss to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. He said, don't you know the devil's sitting around with a very impure word? And that if you don't know where you stand and you don't know whose you are and you don't know who you are. That you will buckle, compromise, capitulate, and run when the Lord needs you to stand. Lord, have mercy.
God didn't need Peter to pull a sword. The Lord didn't need Peter to pull a sword. Peter was a fisherman. He wasn't a swordsman. Lord said, put that thing down, boy, but they're going to kill you. You don't know how to use a sword. You cut the man's head off and cut his ear off. Lord picked the ear up, put the ear back on, and said, don't you know you're going to die by the sword today. Put that thing down. All the Lord needed from Peter was what he needs from you. He don't need you to turn over cars and burn down City Hall and break windows out of the White House. He don't need that from you. He needs you to stand and speak and do what he needed Peter to do. He needed Peter to stand there unafraid and look those soldiers in the eye and don't flinch and say, I'm with him. If he dies, I die. That's all the Lord needed from Peter. He didn't need some extraordinary manly action from him. He needed him to be a man of God. That's what he needs from each and every one of us. For us to have the courage, as Paul said in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, that I probably quote every sermon I preach. Paul says, I beg you, I'm begging you, I'm begging you, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, because of the mercy that God has already given us, that you present your body, present it, present your body as a living sacrifice, Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Lord, if dying for us was the most he could do, living for him is the least we can do. Paul said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change the way you think. Too many of us want stuff to change on the outside before we change stuff on the inside. That's why Paul said, renew your mind. Renew your mind, change your thinking, change your thinking. And in verses 15 of Ephesians chapter 4, Paul gave them some good advice about the pure word. Paul said, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. He says, don't you understand that if you speak the truth, just speak the truth, stand on the truth, that that will change everything. Why? When you walk in the vanity of your mind, it is futile, and you are walking in darkness. Paul continued to warn them in verses 18 of that same chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, as to what's happening and what we see in America right now, that all of these young preachers from this wonderful school are going to have to face. Paul said, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through or as the result of ignorance that is in them because of blindness of their hearts. The hardness of their hearts, they can't see to save their lives. You're going to be preaching the truth. And there are going to be those who are going to accuse you of upholding something that is dead. This old Bronze Age book, we on the wrong side of history, that we wrote this book so because we are searching for God. God didn't give us a book that was from God. And so therefore Paul said to them in verse 22 of that same chapter, he said that you put off, Put off concerning the old man or the former conversation, the old man, the deceived man, which notice what Paul uses that term, corrupt, corrupt according to deceitful lust. Deceitful lust like that old green fly messes up a good life. It perverts and it corrupts a good life. That word corrupt is the opposite of pure, brothers and sisters. It's the opposite of pure. The devil knows that a corrupted word will produce a corrupted soul. The devil knows that a rotten word will produce a rotten soul, something that doesn't smell savory in the nostrils of God. Willie Nelson one, one time say, the famous country singer, he wrote an article one time, and he said, we feed our children food that the bugs won't eat. 
And I thought about what the man is saying. What he's saying is, we put junk on our food that corrupts our food. The bugs won't eat it. And then we feed it to our children. And you know, I said, now that's a profound thought. How many times are we corrupting what God has given us and then we feed it to one another? Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33 and 34 that every one of you can quote. Paul said, don't fool yourself. Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupt good manners. That word communication comes from a Greek term which means to be pressed in. Don't get yourself too close to stuff that will rot you. Like that squash that I had put in that basket that would rot everything that it touched. What does Paul advise them? In verses 34, Paul said, awake, awake, awake to righteousness and sin not. He said, for some have not the knowledge, the knowledge of God. And Paul says, when I speak this, I'm speaking this to your shame. I'm reminded of what the Hebrew writer said in Hebrew chapter 5 and verses 12. The Hebrew writer spoke to those brethren who were ready to throw up their hands and walk away in apostasy, saying, this is too hard. This is too hard. Nobody told us that they were going to be beating us up and cutting us up and feeding us to the animals. Nobody told us they were going to cover us with pitch and light us a fire while we were still alive. What the Hebrew writer said, the same one who went to Thanks Hall of Fame in chapter 11, he said in chapter 5, verses 12, he said to them, when time, when you ought, you ought to be teachers, masters, stronger, fervent, steadfast, unmovable, assured, happy, assessed to God's word. When time, when you ought to be teachers, the Hebrew writer says, you have need that one teach you again. Come back and start all over again and start feeding you milk instead of meat. As Christians, brothers and sisters, the Lord said to us, as Paul said to Timothy, study, be diligent, be diligent to show yourself approved. Get this right. You don't have forever to get it done. Be diligent to show yourself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling aright the word of God. I can feel Paul's misery, his pain, and his worry as he knows he's getting closer to martyrdom. The apostle Paul said to the brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 3 and 4, Paul said, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve by his subtility, so your minds should be, notice the word, corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul told the Galatian brethren they had been hoodooed. They had been bewitched. And he said, I marvel that you're so soon removed. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and verses 7. Every last one of us must keep in mind at all times that the word of God is pure and that God wants it to remain pure and God wants each of us to do what he has commanded for us to do. The pure word of God has a legislative intent. And when I say that, I'm remembrance of something we did years ago. The legislature decided we're going to have zero tolerance with drugs, zero tolerance with weapons in the schools. And we passed that law. And that a child who brought drugs and weapons to school would be put out and expelled for a whole year. Well, what we found out was there were little boys who came proudly in their Boy Scout uniforms with their Boy Scout knife hanging on their uniform that were being expelled from school with that being called a weapon. There were little boys and girls who had a plastic knife in their lunchbox to spread peanut butter and jelly on a, on a piece of bread were being expelled because that was a weapon. You had little girls who had an aspirin wrapped up in a napkin that were being expelled from school because they said that was a drug. 
In essence, brothers and sisters, it lost its intent. The Lord wants us to remember that there's an intent and legislative authority behind the pure word of God. In the book of Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through verses 19, the Lord came to the coast of Caesarea and Philippi, and what he said was, Who do men say that I the son of man am? What are they saying about me out there in the marketplace? Who are they saying that I am? They said, well, you're in good company. Some say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, or Jeremiah, or one of those dead prophets. And then in verses 15, Jesus did to the apostles what he does to each and every one of us. What do you say? What say ye? Who do you say that I am? When men are watching your stand and we're told to be ready, who do you say that he is? When men see you and we're told to prove all things, who do you say that he is? When we're told to preach and as Jude say, stand in defense of those things that are written and have been delivered, who do you say that the son of man am? Peter stood as the spokesman of the group on that day. And he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said to Peter, blessed art thou. My daddy said, blessed. I'm going to say blessed. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my father which is in heaven. I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, upon this truth, this word, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, a few days in the Hadean realm, will not prevent me from building it. Brothers and sisters, on that day, the Lord gave them legislative authority. He said to Peter, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And of course, we know he gave them the baptismal measure of the Holy Ghost So that they could go into all the world, as he said in Matthew 28, 18, and 19, and take the pure word of God to a lost and dying world. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them, teaching them to observe all things. And whatsoever I've commanded you, he says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, the pure word of God is the only hope of salvation. As I finish this lesson this afternoon, I want you to think about that. In the time in which we live, in a time when the innocents are being destroyed, In a time and in a country where 64 million babies have been slaughtered since 1973. You want me to say it again? Where 64 million babies have been slaughtered since 1973. In a state where 15,000 were slaughtered. In 2015, don't even know the number in 16 and 17. In a time where we have lost the validity and the sanctity and the divinity of marriage. In a time where men call evil good and good evil. When we don't separate the holy and the profane. Lord have mercy, this is a time when we need to return to the pure word of God. Because the only thing that's going to save us. The only thing that's going to save this nation, the only thing that's going to hold us together is the word of God. To return back to those things that are written and settled in heaven. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 11 verses 19, they were told to teach this to your children. Teach it to your children. Teach it to them. And Solomon said in Proverbs 22 and 6 that all of you can, quote, train up a child in the way he should go. Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 4 said, bring them up. Both the Hebrew word and the Greek word both means force them up. You don't let them tell you how they're going to be raised. You raise them the way God told you to raise them. 
If we're going to have a generation and a nation 10, 15, 20 years from now that still stands on our motto, in God we trust, you got to raise that generation on the inside of the church. And if you don't do it, like it was said in Judges chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, and also that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord. We can add to that, knew not the word of the Lord, nor yet the works which he has done for Israel. What was the result? The results in verses 11 of Judges chapter 2. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served idols. They served Balaam. It goes on to say at least twice in that book, in those days, there was no king, no rule, no authority in Israel. And every man did what was right in his own eyes. What's happening in America now? We're doing what's right in our own eyes. We don't care what's civil. We don't care what's pure. We don't care what's holy, what's righteous. We don't care what builds and edifies and strengthens. We have become a nation, just like the prophets say, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? He said, no, no, they weren't ashamed. Neither could they blush. We are becoming a society has, that has lost the ability to blush. We have been so inundated with nudity and profanity and pornography and all of these rotten, corrupt things that enter the mind of a man and destroy them, that many of us have become desensitive, have become de desensitized to what we are actually seeing. You better protect your children. You better stand up for what is right. The Apostle Paul said something that the Lord said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 8. When the Lord sat there on that obscure mountain, and the Lord said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Folks say, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't see it. You quote scripture. I don't see it. You preach the gospel. I don't see it. You lift up the cross of Christ. I don't see it. You preach Christ crucified. I don't see it. They don't see it because they're impure in their heart. The Lord says only the pure can see it. Only the pure can see God. And Paul said in Titus 1 and 15, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled, what defiled them? What defiled them? Unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, Paul said, is nothing pure. Brothers and sisters, Paul gave a very disturbing prediction. 2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine or the word, the pure word of God. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and shall be drawn away to fables. What are the fables that are destroying us now? What we see now are men and women who have lost themselves, lost themselves. God told you to go save them. When the apostle Paul talked about all the terrible things about men not enduring sound doctrine, what do you do, Paul? Get more charismatic preachers. What do you do, Paul? Get folks who can quote a more Bible than anybody else. And don't get me wrong. Now, go on and quote. Go on and quote. No, don't go lying on me. Uh, but what do you do? Paul made it very simple. It's not about the stuff we do. Hide ourselves. Put on Christ. In ancient times, when you put on somebody, it was like you put on their strength and their vitality, their financial strength. You were like you became them. What did Paul say to the boy? Preach the word. 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 We can't outdo the devil. We can't outscream the devil, outspin the devil, outrun the devil, outfly the devil. We can't out internet the devil, out TV the devil. 
We're going to do what we do, and we got some folks doing pretty good. But the devil's always going to go another step. That's why the Lord kept it simple. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. With all long suffering and doctrine. In other words, Timothy, make them hear. They don't want to hear. You make them hear. You make them hear. You make them see your strength. You make them see your courage. You make them see your stamina. You make them see that you're not going to back down. I got a brother sitting out there. If I called his name, he fussed at me. But I saw him in Washington, D.C. stand and preach the word. Folks, they want to hear it. But he preached it anyway. There are men sitting out there now on walkers and on sticks and in wheelchairs whose hands are shaking, whose backs are weak, whose legs are not as strong as they were 30 years ago. But they preach the word. They preach the word, young men. They preach the word. They made men here and baptized folks by the thousands. You got to do the same thing. You can't bag down, capitulate, apologize for being a Christian and still save souls. They believe. Why? Because you act like you believe. The Hebrew writer said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and without faith, he continued, it's impossible to please God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Men are only going to develop spiritual, biblical, obedient, righteous faith when we preach the pure word of God. Then they'll believe. And like those men did on Pentecost, when Peter stood there and did his job, ye men of Israel, you hear these words. Whether you want to or not, you hear these words. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel, the foreknowledge of God, you. He looked those murderers in the eye without fear and indicted them and charged them with killing the Son of God. You, with wicked hands, have crucified and slain. At the end of that sermon, when you stand, all of us, as God's children in a world that wants us to disappear, if you stand, if we stand, God said, this is the deal, if you fight, I'll fight with you. If you stand, I'll stand with you. If you run, I'll run right beside you. If you march, I'll march with you. If you speak, I will strengthen your voice. That's what the Lord is saying. I will never leave you. Just do what I tell you. I will never leave you. Those men came crying. Lord, what must we do to be saved? How in the world can we get sin off of us when we kill God's son? He told them what to do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the same boy you killed, the same young man you crucified. Repent and be baptized. When you stand and tell the world, I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Don't you know if the men and women, the families, the elders, the deacons, the preachers, the evangelists, the young and old in this audience, we can save America. We can save America. All we got to do is say it from the highest mountain every day, all day, every Sunday. We've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And men will come so you can change their lives. The Lord said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw. That's a positive statement. I will draw all men, all types of men. I will draw them unto me. If you've been weak and we've all been there, if you've sinned and we've all done it, that's why every day we get stronger and stronger and stronger to one day you look and you don't even know yourself. You're somebody that you thought you never could be. But you got to always face up 
to yourself. Repent if there's something you need to do. God is always willing to forgive. Let's all go to heaven together. All of us got somebody we want to see again, don't we? Let's go to heaven together. Let's 